Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host, and today I'm joined by Richard Black, who is the director of Mind Health down in Christchurch. So welcome, Richard. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. It's really great to have you here, and we're talking about becoming the authentic you. So mm-hmm. Richard's going to talk to us a bit about how we all have deep needs, and our sense of self is really shaped by the degree to which we believe these needs are met, and also how we often believe there's a question mark over a deep need, and it can leave us feeling insecure, and how if you can discover what your needs are, and that they're not under question, like it can feel like, then greater confidence grows by authentically being yourself. So I can't wait to unpack that. So first of all, I'd love to just uh, ask you, Richard, some this and that questions, if that's okay, for a quick sure fire round. Okay, so tell me spots or stripes? Don't care. Okay, either one, flexy, nice. Very flexible on that one. Uh, indoors or outdoors? Uh, probably more indoor person. Okay, nice. Cats or dogs? Yeah, I would say dogs, but we have cats, so I'll probably get myself in trouble. So I'll go cats. Okay, fantastic. Uh, chicken or beef? Beef. Okay. Uh, broccoli or carrot, staying on the food theme? <laughs> oh, broccoli. Broccoli, okay. And would you rather go a month without your car or a month without the internet? Mm. Probably, ideally, I'd like to go a month without the internet. I don't know how practical that would be, but that would be wonderful. Okay, fantastic. And last one, Monopoly or chess? Oh, yeah, either. Very flexible on that. Happy either way. Okay, nice. Wonderful. So Richard is the founder and director of Mind Health, an organisation dedicated to enhancing the well-being of our 5 million people here in New Zealand. He is a counsellor, communicator and author and has been involved in people work for over 25 years. He understands that the everyday struggles that people face and the demands on leaders. He's got the knack of being able to communicate complex issues in a way that's practical and easy to understand. And I've witnessed that myself. I've been along to two of Richard's sessions, which were great. And he's authored two books, Centred, Knowing Who You Are in an Off-Balance World, and also a children's book that's called There's a Happy Moon in My Side. So, Richard, do you want to tell us a bit about how did you get into what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. I mean, prior to this, I was working as a a church leader, and I thought I was going to be a pastor for pretty much the rest of my life. But then I had one of those incidences where I felt like God flick a switch and say, you're going to stop pastoring and you're going to move into this area of helping people with their mental, emotional health. Mm -hmm. And he said, and you'll be good at it which I thought was really kind of him because I had no idea what I was stepping into. But then I I stepped into this area, retrained, got my master's in counselling and in one sense just haven't looked back. Mm, Wow. And so you spend time now doing a mixture of counselling and speaking to groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doing the one-on-one counselling, coaching, supervision, as well as presentation to larger groups of training them in the area of whether it's emotional intelligence where resilience building, regulating their emotions, just learning how to thrive in life. Yeah. And so you mentioned this um, concept of deep needs, that mm. we all have these innate deep needs and that they have been shaped by, you know, at the time over the period of us growing up. Tell me a bit more about these needs, what they are and how they shape us. Yeah, sure. I mean, mean, when you look in in, in different uh, modalities, different counselling, different psychological tools, they'll they'll often talk about deep needs. We see that with reality therapy. You can see that with Tony Robbins. The thing that I found is as I've worked with clients, there are six main deep needs that I find incredibly useful in working with our clients. So the first is significance. We all need to know that we're significant, that that we have a purpose, that we're, it matters that we're here on this planet. It matters that we, we're alive. It, we also need to have a sense of innocence. That is that we're not under shame and condemnation. We also need to have a sense of agency, which is a bit of a funny word, but really it means personal power. If we use a word like power, it can be a bit more 
complex or loaded. So I like the term agency, your ability to influence the world around you. And it's the sort of thing that you see with young children where you may be feeding them in the high chair and then they grab the spoon and they start feeding themselves or they want to tie their own shoelaces even though you're running late. I mean, all of that's just a, um, an example of them expressing and growing their agency. Mm -hmm. We also need to have a sense of um, progress. That is that we've got purpose in this world and that we're moving towards the purpose. We're not, we're not stuck in a rut going around our mountain one more time. Mm. And then finally, two other uh, deep needs that we have. Uh, one is a sense of security, which I put down and describe as being, you know, a sense that the world around me is both predictable and manageable. I have a general sense as to what's going to happen and I, and I know I've got the resources to cope with it. And finally, we all need a sense of belonging. That is, we all need a sense of, uh, of acceptance that we're anchored in a network of relationships with people who love us, care for us. And when we have all of these deep needs sort of met with a kind of resounding yes, what it produces is a person who we would say is confident or secure or grounded or centered. But it's when we have a question mark that's emerged over one of these. That's, that's when we move into a place of pain and that's where we will reach for other things to try to stabilize ourselves that, that show a degree of insecurity. Mm, that's so interesting. Yeah, I really like that, that really all-encompassing summary. So we all need significance, innocence, agency, progress, security and belonging and when you when I reflect on each of those words I can absolutely see that playing out and I think I reflect on that as a parent thinking about how am I providing those six things cultivating those things for my children I reflect on that as a leader and think of clients mm. who are in workplaces and have teams and perhaps teams of leaders really important I'd, I'd imagine to be fostering those things in a oh. workplace setting as well Absolutely. It, it, it's critical all over. So, um, I mean, another talk I do to parents is, is helping them to speak into their child's deep needs so that with significance, say, they help the child distinguish the difference between their work and their worth yes. or in their innocence between uh, being at fault and being faulty. So creating those distinctions is really important at a young age. But of course, also in a workplace, we, we carry the same needs into the workplace where we will ask what will seem like very childish or childlike questions, but they're fundamental ones like, am I accepted here? Am yeah. I safe here? Yeah. And they're just implicit. And the degree to which that is met with a, yes, this is a safe place or I'm accepted here, will be the degree to which a staff member calms down or finds a degree of motivation and enthusiasm and, and there is a greater morale in the workforce. Mm, absolutely, that makes complete sense to me. You know, that whole sense of am I safe is such a foundation and mm. building a, a mm. trust, a high psychological safety workplace where people can just come in and, and focus on getting on with doing brilliant work rather than worrying about am I safe where am I fitting in the pecking order do I need to be defending what I'm doing here should I be covering up my mistakes all those sorts of things so you can immediately see the application yeah mm. so to focus in on we're talking today about becoming the authentic you tell me a bit about what happens you said that you know the issue is that sometimes we have these question marks over these six deep needs and that mm. leaves us feeling insecure so tell me more about that and what we can do about it yeah, yeah. I mean, so what, what I notice happens is as we, we come into this world, we, we look around us into the reflection of the big people, the mums, the dads, the aunties, the uncles, to find out the answer to that question. Am I significant? Am I safe here? Do you love me? Do I have influence? Am I, have I got a purpose? And the degree to which that is reflected back with a yes the degree to which the mums, the dads, the aunties, the uncles can communicate, you are loved, you are wanted, you are significant, you are important. Well, that will be what we internalize. Now, the problem, of course, is that our mums, dads, aunties, uncles, all of those people, they're imperfect human beings. And so as a result, we, we will often end up internalizing something that isn't fully 
accurate or perfect. And, and, and even if their reflection was perfect, the other problem is we're human. And so we're bound to get the wrong end of the stick. Mm. And so the degree to which there is a sense of I am significant or I am a failure or I'm inadequate, the degree to which we, we come to a sense about ourselves is, is what I mean by, is there a question mark over it? And, and when there is a question mark of wondering, you know, am I really significant? Do I really matter? That pl puts us in a, in a world of pain at times. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'll find is that what we will usually take on board is a conditional sense about our deep needs. Yeah, I am significant. So long as I'm performing well, so long as I've achieved well, I am loved so long as everyone approves of me or everyone likes me. And so we can feel quite stable, quite secure. And then somebody else comes into the room and all of a sudden a question mark pops over our deep need. And, and the way that will present itself it is the things that we do to help the question mark go away. The things that we do to feel okay in ourselves. So you might find that a person who's at work and they're, they're overwhelmed with work and they get asked by a colleague, hey, could, could you finish this project for me? Could you tidy this up for me? And everything in them wants to say, no, I've got enough on my plate. But what they find themselves saying is, yeah, sure. sure. Just put it on the pile. And then they kick themselves and they wonder, why did I do that? Well, it's because if I was to say, no, look, sorry, I've just got too much on my plate, the way the person would respond would trigger that kind of question mark in me that would go, ah, oh, I'm a selfish person. I'm not really liked or approved here. And that feeling is so unsettling that it's just easier for me to say yes rather than no. Mm. Or if I've I've come home and I just feel rotten or stressed or I feel like I've stuffed up or I haven't done the right thing, then I find what keeps me company is maybe a bottle of wine or a big packet of, uh, packet of chips or a block of chocolate or something like that that just helps the pain of the question mark go away. Now, does it really go away? No. It, these are just counterfeit things that we do. These are protection mechanism things that we do. Mm. But that's when we start to notice that something's here. I mean, people will often say, I guess that's my insecurity showing, or I guess that's just where I'm insecure in this area. But I'm really interested in what inside of you, what deep need in you is lacking security, for want of a better phrase. You know, in other words, where's the question mark? Mm -hmm. So is that the first place for people to start really to, to be looking at, you know, what is actually being triggered here, what's driving this behaviour, what need is not being met? Because that makes complete sense. And just running back to what you said earlier about, you know, we know that children are often poor interpreters of situations that, you know, even, mm -hmm. and, and again, this is important for parents to know, even as much love and support as you provide for your children, there'll still be situations and scenarios in their lives where, you know, okay. we all get hurt, we all go through things and we start to believe things that actually aren't true about ourselves. And those things can stick with us, can't they? And then be triggered. Mm. So is the key yeah. thing identifying which of those needs is, is being triggered? And if so, you know, how do we do that as individuals? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and certainly one, one of the places, let's see which one is triggered. But the thing about who we are is we are so used to organizing our lives in such a way that we don't like the question mark to be pinged. We don't like our, our sense of inadequacy or our, our sense of being unloved to come to the forefront. So oftentimes we will behave in ways that prevent us from ever feeling that kind of feeling. So when we talk about the authentic self, another way of looking at it that I'll say to my clients who might be struggling with abuse or trauma or overwhelmed with different emotions, I'll say, can you imagine being you, but with freedom? Can you imagine being you, but with, with no baggage? In other words, being free to fully be who you have been created to be. And oftentimes they'll go, well, yeah, but I mean, that would just be weird. That would be unfamiliar. But when you think about who would you be or how would you be different if you felt 
free. You felt like there was no baggage, no hangups, no pop-up insecurities, no reactivity in you. That's the authentic you. And, and what are you doing that's different? So some people might say, well, I, I wouldn't pour so much energy into work or I wouldn't be such a perfectionist or, you know, I, I wouldn't be always trying to make sure everyone's happy and pleased. So those things that you're doing are, in fact, the indication that you're not living the authentic life or that you're living off balance. And so why is that? And, and one question I'll ask people is, so, you know, if we take your perfectionist tendencies and we say, from now on, you are only ever able to do a good enough job and not a perfect job. You know, what, what, what feeling would come to the surface? Or if from this point on, anytime you wanted to say no, you were able to say no, but say it in a completely respectful, constructive way. But if you now imagine you're going to say no all of these times, what feeling emerges? And that feeling is often the pain, the question mark over a deep need. I guess I still need to know that I'm significant or I'm worthwhile or that I'm lovable or that I can be accepted even if I've disappointed someone because I haven't picked up their task, something along those lines. Wow, that's really powerful. And you can just see that application, I think. What would you say to people that, you know, when you ask that question, it made me think about, what if people are almost feel like they're on one side of the cliff and what you're suggesting is that they have no hangups and, you know, nothing, nothing gets triggered essentially. What if they feel like there's a massive chasm between where they're at now and getting to that place? You know, what if they can't even picture you with, oh yes, that would be great. Mm, what would mm. you say to those people? So, so there's two, two different things here. There are those who can't imagine it ever being they can't imagine I don't know what I would be if I was living fully free I don't even know who that person would be mm -hmm. so that that kind of of person for them what they've often mistaken is they've mistaken the tendencies the 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 propensity for anxiety or the the, the hang-ups that they might have or the the comfort eating that they do they've mistaken that they say but this is who I am this is my personality type to which I'll say, did it ever occur to you? It's not your personality. It's your prison cell. And it's time to step out of it. So let, let's imagine what that would be. Now, if people find that scary, there will be what I refer to as a prison guard that keeps them there. Because there's another question like, but how do I know I'll be safe? How do I know I'll be loved? How do I know? Great question. Mm -hmm. And now we need to address that question. Then there's the other ones who go, oh, yeah, I could, I could imagine that of, of what it would be like, but I have no idea how I could ever find my way to that point. And I say, well, that, that's fine. That's part of my job with you. That's what we're going to do together. And what we would look at is a couple of key things. One is we look at the pain of the question mark and how that, that's going to, to cause you to drive into certain types of behavior. But we also take a look at the need that a person has that feels like it's being unmet. And I'll say to a person, you know, what we're going to find out and what we're going to explore that is that this need, the need that you have, that you are significant, that you are lovable, that you have agency, all of that, what we're going to discover is that these needs were never under question, that they were never questioned. I know it feels like that. But I'll take them through a scenario like this. I'll say to them, I'll say, can you imagine holding a newborn baby if you've ever done that? And most people go, yeah, I can imagine. I say, you know, uh, for me, I just love newborn babies. You go, smell them. They're delicious. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say to, to the person, I'll say, so tell me, does this newborn baby have any worth or value? And Usually they'll nod and say yes. If they look at me, and if there's deep trauma, they may find it hard to say yes. But I'll make a shocking statement or a shocking question. I could say, you know, because if you want, we could just kill this baby and move on, and which everyone's sort of horrified. I say, so in that horror response, what you're telling me is, you know, this baby's got inherent worth and value. Mm -hmm. But as you hold this baby, if you were, if you were able to see into the future, and you saw that this baby, as they grew into a person and they were mistreated, they were abused. Tell me, 
does the child have any less significant value or worth? And they'll go, well, well no. But what if, as you're holding this baby, baby, you can see into the future and you can see this child does things that hurt other people where they need to be accountable and apologize to others and make amends. But, but does that reduce the, the value or the significance this child has? And of course, they'll go, well, no, no, they don't. It doesn't. And I'll say, yeah, so because you know instinctively that, that with this baby that's come into this world, regardless of what happens to the child or regardless of what the child does, the child's worth and value remains there and goes nowhere. And then I'll say to them, you see, one of the things I want you to get is you are that baby. You've come into this world with inherent worth and value that you can recognize in other children. And what it, regardless of what's happened to you or regardless of what you've done, your worth, your value, your significance has gone nowhere. But it does feel like that mm. because you've been conditioned to believe something that isn't actually true about you. But wow, it feels powerfully true, but it's never been that way. And then we can unpack that further. And I can do that with you now if you want. But that's, that realization is the beginning point of bringing freedom. Wow. That's, I mean, that's really powerful and quite emotional listening to you talk through that really. And I don't know about everyone else listening in, but yeah, that's really impactful. So, I mean, I was going to ask you, I always think it's great to give people practical tools or what, what can they do with this great info that you're sharing? So I don't know, yeah, if you want to continue unpacking that, or I guess sure. the key thing is for people listening is what can they do? And I know that mm. you work obviously a lot, you know, it'll depend when you're working with a client on where that conversation goes, but I'd love to hear some of your tools and strategies that could be helpful. Sure. For no, very happy to do that. And, and these are the ones that I've got in the book centered knowing who you are in an off balance world. Yeah. But you see, one of the things that I'll take from, from that understanding that the baby has inherent worth and value and significance, which means also that you have this. And people will know this up here, but they find, find it hard to embrace it down here. Mm. And the reason for that is, you know, I'll say, if you imagine a, a house of mirrors, like at a theme park, or uh, the, the filters that you can put on things like Snapchat, and that can make you all look sort of weird and wonderful and and slightly bug-eyed or deformed. Yeah. The, the thing is that if you grew up in a house of mirrors, if you grew up where every reflective surface you looked at had a filter on it, you know, what sense of you would you have? Mm. It would be a, a kind of distorted version of you, but it's, it's what you would feel. And then if finally you left the house of mirrors, you turned off the filter and you saw in front of you a perfect mirror that accurately reflected who you are. One of the questions I'd ask is, so what would people say? What would they say of that reflection? Usually what they would say is, but that's not me. You know, I know what I look like. I'm, I'm weird. I'm distorted. There's something wrong with me. I, I need to placate people. I, I need to eat chocolate. I need to do all of these kinds of things for me to be me. But that's not me. People tell me I look like that person. I'd like to look like that person. Other people look like that person. That person looks really great. But that's not me. Not if you really knew me. Mm. And sometimes people tell me I look like that, but I know they're just being kind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's because we carry a distorted image of ourselves in the background of our mind. And, and what we have is what's called confirmation bias. So we only allow in the messages that confirm the kind of distorted version of us. And if we ever receive anything else that, that reflects something different, that says, no, you are significant, you are lovable, you're worthwhile. We yeah. dismiss it and go, well, they're yeah. being kind. You know, it, it's not really true. If you really knew me. And we filter yeah. it out. And That's so, so interesting. I can I can just picture a lot of clients over the years that I've worked with as well. I don't do so many one-on-ones so much anymore, but I can totally see that. And it's very interesting, that confirmation bias that you mentioned, that we're usually just totally unaware of, that we're actually magnifying the things that we think or believe about ourselves that aren't necessarily true. Absolutely. And we just brush off. The other thing is it's almost a little bit like imposter syndrome where, you know, we think that, oh, we just had this great opportunity by chance and, and that we actually don't have the skills and we're about to be found out, you know, that's quite a prevailing thought that people have because 
they're focusing on perhaps what they perceive as flaws. And I know that what you're what you're talking about when you're talking about this distortion, distorted image of ourselves, not about our physical representation, but it's about who we think we are as a mm, person mm. and our character. Oh, very much so. Yeah. 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 And and that confirmation bias, which is really interesting, we can do that with our loved ones, with our spouse, um, uh, our partner, where we only see what confirms what we've been feeling. And so if we're in a negative cycle and we're harboring bitterness or resentment, guess what we're going to see about them? We're going to see everything that they've just done wrong and nothing that they're doing right. So it's so important to know about our filters. And when it comes to who we and how we see ourselves, you're you're absolutely right with that imposter syndrome as well, where if the person will say, yes, but if I was to believe who I really am, They'll say things like, I don't want to get a big head. Or what's there is I would feel quite vulnerable because what if someone says, no, you're not, and they pull the rug out, they feel like they'll come crashing down. Mm. So a, a simple technique that I use is, and when I'm in front of groups, I'll do the same kind of thing. I'll ask for a volunteer, we'll get somebody up here. And, and I'll start with a, a baseline question. Can you think of a time, you're not going to have to reveal it, but can you think of a time when things didn't go well recently. It felt really horrible. And go, yeah. So, okay, we'll put that up on the shelf. We're, we're not going to ask you what it is. We're just going to put that there. And then I'll ask them, I'll say, one of the, the ways that we start to straighten out ourselves is we have to find trustworthy mirrors. Mirrors that we can look into that we can trust is reflecting back something that's accurate about us. So I'll put it this way. I'll say, so tell me, you know, who are, who are some of the friends that you have, some of the people in your life that you have, that when you are with them, you feel like you can relax and just be you? And invariably, that they'll give me about four or five naps. Now, if it's really struggling, I might get one. Then there are certain people who will give me like 100 names. I've got this full page of names. But usually it's about four, and they'll tell me about uh, Jack, and Jill and John and Jeremy, and they'll tell me about these four people say, and I'll say, right, if we, if you can imagine, if we bring Jack, Jill, John and Jeremy around to you, and, and I say, just being with them, tell me, what's that like? And they'll say, oh, you know, that, that's good. It feels good. It feels nice. It feels lovely here. Okay. And I'll say, so tell me, with, with Jack, Jill, John and Jeremy around you, what, what are the messages that come off them to you about you? What do you pick up? They start to think a bit deeper and they go, oh, well, I guess that, that, that they like me. Yeah, I'll say, you're liked, that, that I'm wanted. Yeah, you're wanted, that I'm fun to be with. Yeah, you're fun to be with. And we'll talk like that. And then I'll say, now, if, if I was to bring around you Jack, Jeremy, Jill, and, and Jeremy, um, John, I think I've mixed up yeah. names, but, but you get what I'm saying. And I say, if I was to ask them to describe, tell me, how can they describe for me uh, who the real person of you is. So, you know, who is this Lauren? You know, if, if I was to ask them, who would they say that you are? And now the Kiwi culture will say, oh, I wouldn't like to say, or I don't know. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to get a big head. They can struggle to give words to this, but they might say things like that I'm caring, that I'm kind, that I'm loyal, that I'm smart, that I'm funny. That, that I'm irritating at times, that they will start to say these things. And I say, yeah, that, that what we've got, and again, I'll bring these people around, and I'll say that they're saying to you that you are that you are kind, that you are caring, that you are loyal, that you are a good friend. And, and I'll reiterate that. So with, with um, Jack, Jill, John, and Jeremy around you, and that they are saying things to you like, we like you, we want you to be with you, you're funny. When they describe you that you are kind, you're caring, you're loyal. And I'll put all this together because I'm trying to dial up what the confirmation bias has filtered out. Yeah. Now, so as you hear this, tell me inside, what, what's stronger there? A sense that I am what? And they'll think about it for a second and they might go, well, I am, I'm loved. And I'll, I'll check with that. I say, yeah, do you actually feel that what's surrounded by these people? Yeah, I do. And I'll say, what else is there? And they might go, I'm acceptable or I'm okay. And again, we'll reiterate that. And I'll say, that's absolutely true. You see, with, with 
Jack, uh, John, Jill, and Jeremy around you with the sense that you are loved, that you are wanted, that you are significant, that they would describe you as kind, caring, loyal, and all of this. And inside, you know, I am loved. I'm okay. I'm worthy. I'll say, you get a sense of what that's like? Yeah, they'll say. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, that is the real version of you. Mm, that's Everything so else has been stuck on. Mm. that is the real version of you mm. yeah, so can you imagine, yeah can you imagine taking that what would be different if you could carry that into every part of your world mm. oh, I'd be calmer I'd be more confident I'd be more decisive yes exactly that's the authentic you the real you mm. and if we take that difficult situation off the shelf and I'll say now surrounded by these people with what you know tell me what's different oh it doesn't seem so big. It doesn't seem so scary. It doesn't seem so overwhelming. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're now connecting with you. And so I'll get people to get a piece of paper, put a picture of them in the middle and put a picture of the, the John, the Jack, the Jill, the Jeremy's around the outside, write in what they would say about them and then dwell on that. In other words, it is if it's a true, helpful mirror to really reflect who you are, mm -hmm. to straighten out this warped sense and to do that every day until there's something in you that goes, yeah, mm. this is who I am. I so that's that. one tool. Yeah, and what a great tool. I was just going to say that's so powerful. And I can imagine for me, as you were describing that, I was picturing, you know, those really close friends of mine that I know just totally accept and love me with all my flaws and all my um, strengths and that I feel totally relaxed around and it is it's a great exercise I can imagine mm. it, it even makes me realize you know something sometimes with leadership training what we'll do is invite people to actually ask colleagues or or friends to share what words you think of when you think of me and you know that's actually you know I guess a real confirmation of sometimes totally. we to, you know mm. we need to look to truths don't we to correct some mm. of the things that we've been holding on to and I love that analogy of of straightening out or smoothing out that distorted mirror. One of them that came to mind as you were talking before is that, you know, they say that comparison is the thief of joy. And I, and I think a lot of angst that we have is that we go into the world and we compare ourselves to what a colleague is doing, what another parent that we see is doing, or things on social media. And, and we can suddenly feel like, oh, I'm not doing that. And therefore, I'm not good enough. And so, yeah, I don't know if your thoughts are on that as well. It's really interesting. Yeah, and, and the thing is, it, comparison is common, but it's unfair because we're not even comparing apples with apples. Yeah. We compare the outside image of somebody with our inner insecurities. Yeah. And so they're never going to measure up. But yeah. again, what that is saying is because I don't have my internal sense, my internal deep need, feeling like it, it's met, that it's it's answered, I, I need to look externally. And in my wondering, my doubt, and my question mark, let me look at other people who look like they've got it all together and bring my question mark up to see if I'm, I'm any good. And of course, that's just going to breed more insecurity. Mm. So we need to put comparison out of bounds because it's it's never an accurate comparison, exactly. but it's it's a, a technique that we're using in an attempt to reassure a deep need. Mm. Let's name what that need is and name what's needing reassurance in us. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, we're, we're sort of heading towards wrapping up, but I feel like we could just talk for hours about this. Is there anything else that, you know, for people that are listening in, if you could say as a great first step, something they could do today, anything else that comes to mind, recommend Richard? First thing I would say, in a, in a state of gentleness, always be kind to yourself. Just start to notice. Start to notice where are their behaviours or ways of being that you would want to be different. Not in a harsh, let me criticise my, but just notice that and be gentle on yourself. And then you can start to ask, what am I feeling in there? And what am I genuinely needing? That would be a great place. Self-awareness is a great starting point. Mm, yeah. And do you feel like this is something we just constantly do and need? Like, I feel like I have a lot of awareness around a lot of the things you've been talking about. And as you've been talking, I'm just kind of peeling back the layers of myself thinking, oh, I could really do some work on this. Is it? Do we ever get this nailed or mastered? 
Uh, I don't think it's it's we're ever perfect at it, but I, I think like exercise, we get stronger, we get more fit, we get more resilient as we go. So I, I think there are certain things that may have been questions for you in the past that are no longer questions for you. But there are different things or different situations where we thought we had it all together and we go, no, that's an invitation for me to grow a lot stronger, to learn something new here. So I think we're always growing in the sense that we can always work on our physical fitness. We can also work on our mental, emotional fitness as well. Mm, very wise words. I love that. So, Richard, if people do want to find out more about you, uh, what's the best way to do that? Well, they can go to our website to, to mindhealth.org or they can look us up on Facebook, Mind Health. Or if you want to have a chat about anything, send me an email to richard at mindhealth.org and I'd love to have a chat. There you go. Easy as that. And what we'll do is have all the links down below in the show notes. So if you're just listening into this, if you want to watch the episode, do head to thrivetvshow.com and make sure you can watch the entire show and you'll have all the show notes down below. Love you to like and subscribe and do all those good things. So thank you so much for your time, Richard. Uh, just to close, just love to ask, if there's one final thing you want to share with our listeners today, what would that be? Know that who you are created to be is someone quite wonderful and allow that to be your true north. Anything that is critical and harsh towards you isn't helpful, but be gentle on yourself to become who you've been created to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your encouragement today. It's been really fantastic. Pleasure. Thanks for having me over. Thank you so much to everyone that's tuned in. That's been another episode of The Thrive TV Show. Go out and thrive. Thank you for listening to The Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons. Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.